if you all put me into a board meeting one day where as soon as I open the door, I'm like, holy shit, I'm fired. I, what did I do? What's going on? That's and, what you uh, thought? <laughs> I literally, literally in my mind, I was like, oh my God. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Blood, Sweat, and Balance Sheets. My name is Mike Whitmire, co-founder, CEO of Flowcast and proudly an inactive CPA as well. Uh, excited for our episode today. We actually have our very own Shivang Patel on uh, with a fascinating journey started in accounting and today on on the podcast. So we're going to dive into everything that happened in the middle of that. Welcome aboard, Bang. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me. I've seen a few episodes and good to be a part of one. So I'm excited right. to chat today and uh, ready to rock and roll. So. Nice. Well, yeah, the, the team wanted us to to chat today. I was excited for it, like to just go through your career progression and how things have, have worked out for you. So let's take it from the top. I'm curious, like, where'd you grow up and how did you get into accounting? Yeah. So I grew up in the other Bay Area, the real Bay Area, as I like to call it, since now I'm officially in Tampa. But I grew up in San Jose in California, uh, was born and raised there for quite a while and uh, went to school in Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, the real Cal Poly for those of you. Uh, and then came back to work at a at a CPA firm called Armanino uh, in San Jose. And really the big impetus of getting me into accounting was it was the major that paid the most. I didn't want to do marketing. I didn't want to do you know anything around different areas that I wasn't really interested in, but I always foresaw myself as a Wall Street guy. And I said, you know, accounting and finance would be good backgrounds for me to get set up on. And sure enough, after my first couple of accounting classes, I said, I like this better than finance. So I decided to stick with that. I ended up doing a dual major just because finance was a few more credits. And I figured, why not double if you can? But it was a good experience. And I remember when I first met our HR recruiter, Vicky Mole, if you're watching this, shout out to you because you are the one that got me started into accounting. I was a junior in Cal Poly sitting in the top row of the accounting club with my Giants hat on, probably so low, hoping no one would see me in this place. <laughs> and I learned a ton. I'm like, yeah, it seems kind of interesting. I walk out and she taps me on the shoulder and she says, hey, have you applied to Armanino? And I said, who the hell are you? And she went out through her background. She scheduled me an interview. And from there, it was really on to the world in terms of uh, joining Armanino on the accounting path. And that's so... Nice. Awesome. Sounds pretty, you know, like fairly, fairly standard path into it. But I will say Cal Poly is a bit of like a unique school. You want to dive in and it feels like majoring in accounting at Cal Poly feels like a bit of a contrast. You want to just like tell me, yeah, tell everyone yeah. about the school and kind of why it's a little bit unique? Yeah. So so Cal Poly is a polytechnic university, which means they major in a lot of technical subjects, mainly engineering. They're actually known as the best engineering school west of the Mississippi. And a lot of my buddies were mechanical engineers, civil engineers, electrical engineers, even a couple of biomedical dudes that were just geniuses. So you can imagine when I'm in the group, they're telling me, hey, what engineering path are you on? And I immediately said, no, I'm not. I'm in business. But the business program, believe it or not, was the second or third top major program in Cal Poly. And so it was pretty interesting. Today, they're actually even better. I mean, I think an average GPA to get into the school in the business major is like 3.9. So, I mean, it's quite rigorous now, but <clears throat> I guess I was going against the grain a little bit in terms of what the parents wanted, but uh, it worked out and ended up being a good decision. Uh, but Cal Poly taught you everything you really needed in terms of the business acumen. I mean, every single senior before you graduated, they had to do something called a senior project. And that could be your choice. Uh, some people built a farm, some people built an engine. You know, for, for me, I couldn't do any of those things. So what I ended up doing was people's taxes for low-income families around the neighborhood. Oh, very and, cool. Uh, yeah, it was something that we did for about nine to 10 weeks, and it was about 20 of us. And so we'd show up every Saturday for about eight hours and bang out some taxes. And I didn't think of this at the time, but that's what built my knowledge. And I ended up doing returns for my parents, even though I was in accounting. And the most common misconception is you don't do taxes. So <laughs> that was kind of funny, but uh, it ended up being turning into a small business of mine in the beginning. So very cool. I didn't, I didn't know that you were uh, doing tax returns back in the day. The yeah. what, yeah, what I always found interesting about Cal Poly is it, it seems like there are a lot of people building things. Like you mentioned the projects were building a farm or building a, you know, something on the mechanical yeah. engineering side. And so just, you kind of combine that with it it plays into entrepreneurship well, right? And we had hired a few Cal Poly people up front who took a risk on Flowcast. It just felt like like you guys had an entrepreneurial spirit and liked building things, even if you majored in accounting. So I don't know. I always got that vibe from you and some of the other folks that we hired out of Cal yeah. Poly. 
it was interesting, believe it or not. I mean, my, my probably one of my favorite classes was not accounting. I mean, there's no, but one of my favorite classes was the history of aviation at Cal Poly. Hmm. From Tell the Wright brothers all the way to today, from Cessnas to your 747s, they went through the whole history of how aviation got started, what the mechanical parts are. I mean, I know things about an airplane more than I probably should just because of that class. And it was something that just came natural to me where I think I was the, the number one student in that class without hardly studying. And that's not a bragging moment by any means. It was just, it, it's a, an example of when something really, you when you enjoy something so much, it just it kind of sticks to you and you want to learn more about it. So. It's so fascinating. All right. This is a couple of things coming full circle. So Simon Sinek is speaking at our user conference coming up. Love Simon. Awesome. Love Simon. And one of his presentations is about passion and things. And he talks about the Wright brothers and how the Wright brothers were competing against some other uh, aviation company that was like very well funded. It was like a venture capital type situation, like the equivalent of someone raising $250 million and trying to yeah. do an electric vehicle versus Elon scrappy hustling, doing his own thing, taking on his own money to build it. And it was like the Wright brothers were just the unfunded scrappy guys who had all the passion in the world to actually fly. And they beat the well-capitalized company. Did you guys learn about that in the class? That's pretty interesting. We did. Yeah, we yeah. did. It was actually a story of David and Goliath almost. So yeah. I think we were spot on. Yeah. And turns out, I mean, the passion is what reigns supreme. I mean, you put your head into it, do it for the right reasons, results will come out. So and I think that was that was pretty cool. The conclusion of the story was that the the per, the founder running the capitalized one, as soon as he found out the Wright brothers were the first ones to fly, he threw in the towel on it and said, "Well, I don't get the glory anymore. I don't want to do it." Yeah, that's and it. it's that's like, what, gosh, that's that's when ego. Yeah, that's when ego overtakes passion and and what you truly want. So I think my my philosophy is always leave ego at the door. You'll do much better. Nice. Well, I've certainly seen that seen that on display at Flowcast. All right, let's keep let's keep going. Tell me more about your yeah. time at Armenia. So Armenino was my first gig out of college, and I was fortunate enough to have a couple of internships at Armenino. So I was one of those folks in a junior uh, going into my senior year where I did primarily an audit and a tax rotational internship. And I wanted to do both just to get an idea of what both worlds look like. Coming out of that, I was actually in another position where they gave me a full-time audit internship. And by now I built relationships, I knew partners. So when I actually graduated in the fall of 09 with my finance and accounting degree, I started directly in January, right into busy season. And I'd already known three, four partners. Uh, I'd already had good relationships with folks that were an intern turned into a senior by the time I showed up. So that was oh, okay. cool. Um, and then that was my entryway into technical accounting and really the whole subject of auditing, mainly on SEC technology companies. I did some nonprofit work in the summer when things slowed down, but mainly it was SOX testing, technology audits, and SEC public company audits. Um, but yeah, quite a beast, quite a beast to say the least. So. Yeah, it's it seemed like when when you and I had met, I mean, you had like a breadth of experience with the the private and public, and I, I feel like you being in the Bay Area at Armenino specifically just gave you so much good exposure and you got to see the different like stages of company growth. Is that a fair, big fair statement? Yeah. Big time, big time. And it's actually something that I, believe it or not, I did not apply to a big four in our, in uh, Cal Poly. Oh, interesting. Was that intentional or you were just like, I got a job, I'm over it. No, no, it was, uh, it was intentional because in talking to a lot of my folks, my friends that had gone down that road, they said, Hey, you're going to be doing one section of the balance sheet for probably a year. And you're going to want to shoot yourself. It's going to be boring. You're going to want to quit. And I said, how can I get that experience at a much faster pace? And a regional firm was the answer. So when I when I met Vicky and I found all this information out, I knew Armanino was the right path for me. And huge hats off to them. I mean, without their, you know, my them taking me under their wing and teaching me the ropes, uh, I definitely wouldn't have known what I what I know today. So that's, that's really thoughtful. And some advice, I think people uh, who are considering what to do with their career, maybe majoring in accounting today should really consider, you know, I think there's a big benefit to going regional, the more companies you work on, the more of the balance sheet you get to uh, work, the more you learn. <clears throat> and I did go, I was a big four, I was at EY, but I got lucky. It was not, it was not intentional. I just ended up in the mid market group. Wow. And so fortunately I had a rotation of you know, four or five clients with a couple of random ones sprinkled in. So I, I was really lucky to get exposure to all of that. Like, yeah, being stuck on Disney auditing accounts receivable across all their yeah. entities, like all year long would just be, that's not a good learning experience. So if you're watching, push for more exposure, try to get on the smaller jobs. It's a little counterintuitive, but you want the less sexy logos uh, on your audit resume because you learn more. 
Yeah, you just learn more. And for me, I wasn't really big on a logo, right? It was the knowledge that I gained. I'll give you a good example. Within my first six months, it actually is what led to my next role that we'll jump jump into here shortly, I'm sure. But within six months, I was doing revenue at a company called Sunrise Telecom, where I met Jim Walker. Okay. Who ended up being my future boss. And within six months to have a first year staff start revenue, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing, but they gave me the revenue workbooks and they taught me how to do things. And I was so appreciative of that experience because it's really what taught me the most, you know, what goes into these different, it's back when 081 was out in multi-element arrangements and that uh, was my first yes. exposure, your mm-hmm. baby, by the way. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, that was my first exposure to that world. And I just, I ate it up. I thought, it was oh great. man, I was the one implementing that and hating the auditors who were auditing that <laughs> and, and questioning my estimated selling prices and all that, all that <laughs> good stuff. Gosh, 081 oh, was a beast. Like the people complaining about 606, they... They don't know. They don't know what oh, we yeah. had to deal with with 081. It was, I mean, when you have hardware and software, oh my God. And you have an auditor to try to say, how do you allocate prices to this multi-element arrangement? I mean, it is it is a battle. Until oh, you I didn't even have to deal with hardware. Oh, geez. Yeah. You got margins yeah. and stuff that go around with like the, the, the oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, we had 081. <laughs> Not just at sunrise, but also at rocket. So it was it was pretty crazy. All right, I'm gonna I'm having flat like nightmares flashing back to this. <laughs> let's uh let's uh let's move on to ruckus. This is uh the the beginning of us of us starting to come together. Yeah, absolutely. So so after my time at Armanino, um, I was fortunate enough to be recruited by one of my clients, Jim Walker, the gentleman I previously spoke of. Uh, he was the corporate controller at Sunrise Telecom, and I remember he pulls me aside. He says, "Hey, dude, you want to go to lunch today?" And I've got like seven people in the audit room with me, and I'm like. You just talking to me or these other six people are coming too? you know, what's going on? He's like, no, no, just, you want to grab a bite? And he kind of just said it really, you know, lackadaisical. I said, yeah, let's go. And so at lunch, he said, Hey, uh, I'm quitting. Um, I'm leaving sunrise and I'm going to a pre IPO company. It's near your place in Sunnyvale. And it's this company called Ruckus Wireless. Uh, I said, okay, great. I said, I'll miss you. It was my first words out of my mouth. I didn't know what else to say. And so then he goes, no, no, man, I want you to come with me. And I said, well, what do you want me to do there? What would my role be? You know, like staff accountant or something. And he goes, no, I want you to be my accounting manager. And sure enough, I felt like a moron. I said, well, what do accounting managers do? And he said, uh, you'll be responsible for closing the books. And then now I'm a trifecta. I'm like, well, what the hell is closing the books? man? <laughs> I've never heard of that. I, I just get a bunch of word papers after 50 people look at them and then I can audit them, you know? So he so said, wait, how many years at Armanino are you at this point? I uh, just did about two and a half years. I was on the path to senior um, and actually seniored a few jobs. And at this point, I was a staff at the Sunrise job. Okay. Um, but I'd seniored a couple of jobs as like kind of a probationary test, if you will. And so I knew I'd get the promotion next year. And at this point, I think a, a big thing I forgot to share was my whole mindset was the record at Armanino was becoming a partner in about 13 years. I wanted to do it in 10. And that was my big, big goal. Uh, so here he comes presenting me this opportunity. And so I said, Hey, well, I shared that goal with him. And I said, I wanted to be partner. And he said, you can, you can go down that road and you'll be successful, but how much will you truly learn? And learning from start learning by creating something from scratch is a whole lot different than learning in your current role. And that was the first time that anyone's ever told me that. So after I joked and I said, Hey, how do you close the books? He did tell me, he said, well, I've done this thing for 25 years. I know how to close the books like the back of my hand and I can teach you everything. And I, I, had, I had to ask him, I said, well, why are you taking a shot on me? I, I don't even know the role. I, I barely even know the responsibilities. He said, I like your personality and I like your attitude and I can stand you. And I, <laughs> literally, I, I <laughs> as an auditor, I can stand you too. Yeah, yeah. He's like, I can stand you. He's like, you're literally my favorite auditor. I want to hang out with you. And so at first I didn't quite think I was, I was in that mindset of, you know, using multiple syllable words and business acumen and all this professional stuff. I didn't know that personalities were really reign supreme. I mean, it's yep. the number one trait you can is be authentic. That's it. People so, recruit people they like working with. It's a, uh, yeah, an interesting lesson you get, you start to learn in the real world. Exactly. Exactly. So I like Jim. The more, the more I hear about Jim, the more I like the guy. He's awesome. He's great. I mean, uh, I'm sure if he watches this, I call my second dad and Wendy second mom. I mean, they've, they've been great to me, both of them. So um, we have a lunch and I immediately go back to my desk. And uh, I think right then and there, I told my senior, I was like, Hey, do you have a moment? 
I already knew I was going to go. Whoa, and, uh, whoa, Jim's a sales yeah. guy too. There we go. Yeah, he knew. He knew the right buttons to push. So immediately I, I told her, I said, hey, he offered me an opportunity. It's, you know, I don't want to leave during the job, obviously. I'll, I'll finish out the engagement. And then, you know, it was about a four week transition period. So I finished out the engagement, talked to the partners, and everyone supported me. I mean, to the point where Armanino is not named Armanino by accident. The Andy Armanino is the managing partner. His dad started the firm. One day he came over to the San Jose office <clears throat> and I'm sitting in my queue, non-chargeable time, just waiting for the two weeks or four weeks to end up. And uh, he walks up to my queue and he says, hey, Siobhan. And I'm like, oh, shit, you know my name, you know? And he tells me, he's like, hey, by the way, I've heard you're leaving. I've heard nothing but great things about you. If you ever decide to come back to Armenia, you know, there'll be a home for you. And I just, that example is obviously so amazing to hear, but what it led me to believe is all the hard work that I put in day in, day out. I didn't have any expectations. It led to something positive. It led to recognition by somebody that I would never have even known how to say hi to. Right? Yeah. So, so I thought that was pretty cool. And it was a good transition out of Armanino. Um, you know, I'll also say you did it the right way, like to go to your senior, be transparent about it and give them time to offboard and everything. Like there's, there's a lot to be said about being that transparent and, and just being, uh, being a good citizen on the way out about how you're transitioning yeah. work. I mean, it's, it's a big life principle of mine too. I mean, you don't deceive anybody, you don't do anything wrong and then good things happen, you know, and I know that's a lot easier said than done, but in any case, it worked out for me in, in this, uh, in this set. Awesome. But, <clears throat> so then after that, I, I ended up starting at, uh, at Ruckus and, it was really cool because it was actually walking distance to my house. So it was really, really awesome. And I remember I, I showed up and there was three accountants and now I was their boss. And I sit down in the cube and sure enough, the first thing Jim tells me is, hey, we have a bunch of accounts that never been reconciled. And at this point, Ruckus was going through a three-year prior, prior period audit. Oh boy. We, we had a CFO named Seamus who I'll probably say his name so many times throughout this podcast, but mm -hmm. Seamus and Jim were the dudes that taught me everything, hands down. Uh, and so Jim comes to me and says, Hey, we've got a bunch of account reconciliations that need to be done. Can you jump on that? I said, yeah, no problem. And so I jump into the GL. We're using this ERP called expandable. No one has ever heard of it. I'm sure you haven't. It's I have heard. Yeah. Thing. You, you were not on yeah. expandable when we met. So, okay. <laughs> so we were, we started off on expandable and it's a manufacturing ERP because Ruckus mainly distributed and, com and manufactured commercial Wi-Fi equipment. Okay. So so we're on this ERP. And so I, I jump into the accounts and I print out the GL detail. And it's like 15 pages, right? I'm like, okay. I staple it. And then I go to his desk and I'm like, here you go. And he looks at me and he looks at the 15 pieces of paper and just starts laughing. And he goes, <laughs> this is not a reconciliation, Shavong, you know, tell me what's in the balance and just make it in one page. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how long that took me, Mike. Oh my God. I was sitting through hours and hours. I think the first week I didn't go home till midnight, 1, 2 a.m. Just because I was trying to figure out the lay of the land. Yeah. And you're probably too embarrassed to ask him details at that point, right? Where you just oh, like hacking your yeah. way through it. At this point, I was asking the three other accountants and they're like, the whole time they're like, well, what did we hire you for? <laughs> you close the books. You don't know how to do that. You don't even know how to do a reconciliation. I remember uh, one of my counterparts, T, we're best friends now. So she, she, if she hears this, she'll laugh. But she went up to Jim and she's like, are you sure you made the right hire? <laughs> and I laugh about it now just because fast forward three, four years. And, I mean, it's it's been a great experience, right? So Yeah, yeah. I, I actually met T on site as well when we were there for the, the video and she's great. Tells it like it is. Exactly, yeah. And she's actually, <laughs> today she's working for Wendy in San Jose Water Company. Oh, so. awesome. She's one of her top accountants. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a good family. I always, I like to say the Ruckus family, we still text each other on birthdays. We text each other on holidays. We try to meet up whenever we're in the Bay Area to try to get dinner or drinks or something like that. And it's just a good camaraderie. And, and again, coming off of my Armanino experience, here I was having a similar relationship with my Armanino peers to only compound it tenfold with my Ruckus peers, mm -hmm. right? And, and build yeah. a lifelong friendship. So I mean, accounting can do wonders outside of just, you know, crunching numbers. So that's you, you hear kind of time and time again, what's your favorite part of accounting? And it's basically always the team. The that's team. that's what I hear from people. And I definitely got that sense of ruckus. You guys were like a family. And I think Jim's good at hiring for culture and personalities and who's going to mesh. And then he teaches you the stuff along the way, right? That's that oh, yeah. seems to be his MO. It was pretty cool. I mean, uh, one of the things I think T actually instilled this. So now that I've, you know, fast forward a year and some change. Uh, I'm pretty well versed in the close now. Obviously, I know how to do reconciliations at this point. 
And uh, I remember T, <clears throat> she comes up to me and she goes, hey, during the close period, and at this point, I think it took us like 10 or 12 days. Um, so it was quite long. And she said, you know, we got to improve this and we got to reduce this. So I said, yeah, okay, well, how do you figure we do that? She said, well, we get a lot of distractions during the close. People come up to us asking for expense reimbursements or randomly asking us to code POs, just other distractions during a time where we don't, you know, we can't really mess around. Mm -hmm. So she implemented this new thing. It was like a red flag. Anytime you had the red flag, any accounting department member that had the red flag on top of their cube, that literally mean, meant do not F with us, you know, at all. Mm -hmm. And at this point, until the red flag comes down, do not mess with us. So I remember certain engineers would even try to come to T and she would literally just point at the flag and keep doing her thing. It was hilarious, man. And simple, but effective. Yeah, it was simple, but effective. And it worked for years. I mean, we kept that thing going for, I think, all the way until I left. I like it. That's that's very clever. I wish I had done that when I was a senior <laughs> accountant reconciling my professional services revenue yeah, back in the day. Definitely T's credit and it worked out. So um, that was pretty cool. But So all that said, you were still trying to make improvements around the month end close, right? And then a couple of random dudes showed up. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So at this point, even before the dude showed up, uh, what we did is we went through, we knew the ERP had to be, you know, squashed. So during my first year, we actually implemented SAP, uh, Business by Design. It was a cloud-based ERP. And we first did it at corporate, pretty typical. We had a partner involved. And at this point, I'm part of, I'm a key user for the finance and accounting department. And there's about six or seven other key users and a handful of executives. And we're just doing SAP all day and then accounting work at night. Got so it. So as the implementation is kicking off, um, we started to learn just how the business operates. I started to learn how the business operates. I mean, my goal was if I can understand from when a PO is issued to when a check is collected, and I know everyone's role in between that process, I'm going to know all the ins and outs of accounting, and I'm going to know how to troubleshoot issues. And so even though I was only responsible for this one section in finance, I started to learn all the sections. And mm -hmm. that kind of turned me into this like, they called me the SAP guy. Some people would say SAP guru, but uh, I think SAP guy works better. Um, but that was pretty nice because I actually built relationships with VPs. I built relationships with folks that I probably wouldn't interact and collaborate with on a day-to-day -day basis. And so it also learned the biggest and the number one thing I'm most proud of as part of that implementation. It taught me how to put out fires in real time. I mean, when... You have an CFO, example? Oh, yeah. So when your CFO comes... Actually, let me give you a better one. I'm in India and I'm implementing SAP to our Bangalore entity. And there's about 15 ruckus employees all around a big boardroom conference. And I'm kind of at the head of the table broadcasting my screen while they're on their laptops and we're going through training. And this particular section was uh, how to do a bank reconciliation, right? Mm -hmm. And SAP had a module to do it. So we started going through it and I'm working through it the same way I did for Taiwan, for some of the other subsidiaries, for the US, of course, for the UK. So I'm like, I know this stuff, right? As I'm going through it, I end up getting into a error and I'll spare you the details, but it was a currency error. And I've never, ever come across that before. And I've got 15 people that are literally staring at me like, how do you fix this? So immediately I said, hey, we've been doing this for a while. It's been about two hours since we've been training. Everyone let's break for lunch. You know, let's go grab a bite, not a problem. And I said, I'll catch up with you guys just because there was like a restaurant right downstairs. I said, I'll catch up with you guys. They all went down, uh, grabbing a bite. At this point, I'm calling SAP. I submit a high priority incident. And thank God, they helped me out right away, gave me the exact, it was like a blog or a forum. I had to go to page like 32 or something to find the answer that I needed. And so it took me about an hour. Once they came back, I'm like, okay, guys, uh, let's go continue on. So they didn't even skip a beat. It was like they didn't nice. even notice anything, right? And and I think to me, you know how big I am about perception. Perception is key. So if you can keep your calm and keep your cool and still troubleshoot and figure out an issue that your team is going to actually be proud of, I'd say that's pretty damn good. Cool. Nice. Yeah. The ERP implementation, man, you learn so much about businesses and working with other partners. Like it's really, it's, it's a grind, as you know, it's hard, yeah. right? Yeah. I helped with NetSuite at, at my last role and whoo, man, but you learn so much. You do. Yeah. It's, and I'm super thankful for that experience. I mean, it also allowed me to travel some across the globe. So yeah, that's very cool. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. But now to your point, back to the two dudes, uh, you being one of them that walked in through the door at Ruckus 
And I remember this vividly. I mean, it's, uh, you know, what they say whenever there's a major event or a big change, birthdays, things like that, you remember those details, right? So this to me, was a big event. And um, it's day two of the close. <clears throat> At this point, we've gone down to a five-day close. We're public already. We're in a full SOX environment, 404B compliant. I mean, we do not have time to waste, right? I mean, if anything, we probably have like 50 red flags around our cubes. Yeah. So at this point, day two of the close and uh, Jim walks up to me, I'm grabbing a coffee and he says, Hey dude, you got 30 minutes. I've got these two dudes here from Flowcast that are going to show us some software. And I'm like, I literally look at him, laugh and I walk away. I'm like, Jim, I got to manage this close by the minute. Otherwise we're going to be delayed. You know, and that's really how it was. It was pretty hectic. Um, in any case, he then grabs my arm and he says, no, they're here to help you with your job in managing the month end close. So that perked my ears right away. And I said, okay, cool. Let's check it out. As we're walking to the boardroom, I mean, I see you all from afar. I'm like, wait a second. I'm thinking two executives, you know, I mean, two baby, but I mean, you guys had suits on. You look sharp. It was cool. <laughs> oh, thank uh, you. And uh, I was like, these two young guys are like, I immediately felt the entrepreneur bug in me come out again. Right. And uh, you probably recall this too, but as soon as we sat down to fire up the demo, I actually paused you and I said, Mike, number one thing I want to learn is how did you start the company? Who are yep. your investors? How did you get funding? And you spent 20 out of those 30 minutes of the meeting catering to my wishes, right? Which I absolutely loved. Um, obviously, we proceeded with the demo. And when you showed me how to tie out the reconciliations, mind you, this was something I was doing manually, 300 balance sheet accounts with five, six iterations. I was back when superseding TVs actually made sense and you staple them in a binder. So I'm, I'm manually tying these out and it took me hours because I'm conducting my review simultaneously. You clicked a button and did my job in like 10 seconds. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, it was pretty sweet. So I don't know if you recall, but I immediately tapped Jim and I said, dude, I don't know how much this costs. I don't really care. I want it and I want it now, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna help me do my job better and more importantly, you've always been asking me to get out of the weeds, get more strategic, right? Be a part of more of a manager as opposed to a doer. And I said, this is going to allow me to do that. And so fast forward about a week and a half, not only did we sign the contract, our, our legal guy looked at the contract and he says, in literally five minutes, he goes, this is very standard. I don't need to review this. Go for it. It was pretty it, cool. It yeah. was very yeah. standard. It was pretty standard. Yeah. And it, it helps that our GC was, I downloaded. Yeah. I mean, it was cool that the GC and, and Jim were right next door to each other in the office. So yeah. we'd always have a good relationship. So about a week and a half after you guys showed up, not only did we sign the contract, we were implemented. Um, and we started using it for our, I think it was our Q1 close at that time. Um, so for a quarterly close too, but we were willing to take the gamble because it was so straightforward and such an easy to use application. I think we set it up in a day or so. I mean, it was yeah. pretty, yeah. Well, you had the co-founders doing the setup for you. That was at the time. <laughs> Chris and I were doing implementations. This was a, a pre-Lilith uh, phase That's of Flowcast. Right, yeah. so glad that was we, probably glad in, between it Chris, in between Chris writing a blog post or maybe servicing a ticket or, <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. Dude, when you got implemented, we couldn't upload a workbook template thing. So I would spend all night flipping back and forth between Excel and the Flowcast app and copy pasting like, Oh descriptions my and assignees and due dates. It was just like, talk about doing things that aren't scalable. Like, oh, I was grinding. <laughs> Dude, I had no idea you did that. That's crazy. Well, I guess we're both learning something new on the yeah, show. Yeah, no, it was like, I think we did uh, after 10, we were like, something's got to give. And we built that, the upload feature, which is still, it's crazy. Fast forward seven years, it's like the same process that we created oh, in 2015 for the uploads and everything. Yeah. But I'm glad it was smooth from your perspective. That's what matters. Perception, right? That's reality. <laughs> Perception is key, baby. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, it was smooth sailing. I loved it. I mean, it to the point where, you know, I'd used Flowcast for several periods. It was something I, I enjoyed. It made my life a lot easier. Um, and then, you know, at, at this next stage, I, I started to do reference calls for you guys, right? And this was one where <clears throat> I think I did a reference call. Actually, sorry, I should back up. Let me Let me rewind a bit. So now it's about three and a half years, four years at Ruckus. I've implemented SAP. I've, I've done everything that I possibly could. And I started to see a potential ceiling. And I also became, my attitude changed. I think the passion that I had in accounting started to maybe change a bit because I thought I was going to be in this month and close debacle for the rest of my life, right? And every month it was the same thing. 
And so I started to think of, well, you know, how much, how can I continue learning? Is it transitioning to finance, maybe going under the FBA guys? But then again, you know, Ruckus was my first industry or job outside of public accounting. So immediately, I mean, this was a bold move. I do not recommend this to anybody watching this or listening to this. But I remember on a Monday morning, I submitted my resignation notice. And it was pretty crazy. Jim had no idea it was coming. And he supported me fully. He heard all of my comments and the reasoning. And this is something I'll never forget. Immediately, the CFO, Seamus, comes storming down the hall. I mean, you could hear this guy walking from a mile away, dude. He walks like 100 miles an hour. It's crazy. <laughs> so he comes storming down the hall and he goes, Siobhan, do you have a minute? And I said, yeah, yeah. He goes, come to my office right now. And as we're walking to his office, he tells his EA, he says, hey, all my afternoon, my morning meetings, cancel them. I'll let you know when I can come back in and shuts the door and then says, Jim told me you're resigning, you know, and he goes, why? And so I explained my reasoning again, another guy that supports me. He goes, hey, if you want to transition to the sales department or any other department in the company, let me know and I'll, I'll let you transfer, you know. And I said, it's not that, Seamus. It's I got to really know if the grass is greener on the other side or not. You know, I've got to have experience at another organization to really grow. The thing I'll never forget is he whiteboarded different job opportunities for me for four hours in his office. Whoa. And we went from PLM or product management. We did business development. We did sales. We did marketing. I mean, we did all the functions. To this point, I had no idea outside of accounting what's what I could do, right? So the last two things on the board were business development and sales. And those are the ones I didn't cross off, right? <laughs> and so I said, uh, I don't know about sales. I mean, you think I could be a sales guy? I have no idea. I said, business development sounds pretty cool. Uh, and so he said, okay, well, if you want me to connect you to our VP of sales, he can kind of give you the ropes and all that stuff, right? So this is Monday. And then the day is ending. Wednesday, that same week, I do a reference call for a Flowcast prospective client. Thursday, I end up reconnecting with the sales manager at Flowcast, and I'm just giving feedback you know, of, hey, how the call went. And, and I think I broke it down something like, here's what I think is going well. Here's what I think is going wrong that you need to address. And here's what I would do if I was in your shoes to address those points, right? Um, fast forward, uh, five weeks later, I have a signed offer and I'm moving from the Bay to LA to take a flow cast. And it was pretty cool. So I got hired on, as you very well know, as the one of the first account executives at Flowcast, uh, primarily responsible for selling and demoing the product. Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you how it went from my end. Yeah, please. I want to it. So I so met you, you know, yeah, I, I remember that meeting uh, very vividly. And as we were leaving, I was I, I was like, man, that Siobhan guy's awesome. Like whenever when it's time for us to hire a CFO. I'm going to, I want to hire him. That was, that was my takeaway from that. Like I could just tell you had the charisma, the panache, all that stuff. And obviously the, the knowledge and the tech uh, background as well. I just knew that you were, you were going to do really big things. And so I, I left like, he's going to be our CFO one day. And then when uh, I was told that you were leaving ruckus, I was like, you know, no, uh, holy shit. That's our champion. He does reference calls for us. That's a bummer. However, I think Siobhan could sell for us now. I wonder if you'd be interested in trying something new with selling. And my my first order of business, though, was, was calling Jim and clarifying, like, hey, Jim, I'm not poaching your employees. You know, Siobhan is leaving on his own. I had this idea, wondering if you think I could run it by him around, around coming and sell for Flowcast. And Jim was just like, oh, yeah, great. Yes, I know. You know, he wants to try something new. That's a great idea. I think it'd be a really good fit for him. So you should talk to him about the, the sales role. And so I got Jim's blessing before having that conversation. And yeah, man, it was like just refreshing how open-minded you were. You wanted to try something new. And then obviously you have that, the inherent sales abilities. And so it just all lined up perfectly. I cannot believe how well that timing worked out. And so, yeah, our, our uh, second full-time account executive at, at Flowcast came on board and started selling and did a great job. Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, it was a good experience and a good path. And I think um, I'm just super fortunate. I think having spent the last seven years here at Flowcast, which is twice the length of my longest career before that at Ruckus. Um, I mean, I'm learning something new every day. And I mean, I'm sure we'll we'll jump into the roles I've had here at Flowcast. But um, I think starting off on the sales side was the foundation that I needed. I mean, I don't know if you remember in the house, you probably taught me the five most critical things that I needed to know in sales. What, right? what was that? I'm curious. Uh, I mean, you had, what's the contract value? What's the implementation start date? 
right? Has legal been reviewed? Has IT been reviewed? And what are the blockers or any challenges? And have you addressed them? Mm-hmm. And so I remember at the time, I wasn't tracking it that way. I mean, somebody would tell me, hey, I'll, I'll call you back. I'd be like, great, call me back. <laughs> and then I'd hang up, <laughs> you know, so, so I had no idea. And I, I remember my first cold call, I would ask a voicemail, hey, how's it going? And <laughs> You told me, you said, you said, Hey man, you can, it's a voicemail, bro. You can ask how it's going. I remember. Yeah. Cause yeah. you sat, you sat six feet away from me on the, the desk. You took that top spot right by, uh, right by yep. Chris and I, and it was so funny. Cause yeah, those are the days you can overhear everyone's coaching each other on everything yeah. and, and helping yeah. each other out. And that's how you get ramped up. But a lot of sales is trial and error and, and looking, you know, not sounding too good on a phone before you fix something. And then you start to sound uh, better. I think there's a lot of uh, accounts. We don't appreciate how much um, organization is required, how much follow up, how how difficult it really is to be a sales rep. Like it's it's not quite as easy and glamorous as you think from the from the outside world. No, that's very very true. I remember uh, in the beginning, I think it was my first three four days in sales. Uh, whether it was you or Chris or somebody, I went up to and I said, "Hey man, like I used to burn the midnight oil in accounting. I can do more. You just you guys want me to just call people? Like that's it? Like." <laughs> Are you sure? And send a few emails. Like I could do more, man. You want me to do the accounting work and like the evenings or something, you know? And uh, it turned out that I'm glad that I only said that the first few days because it became very, very busy. Soon. Yeah. Like you're emailing prospects at night. Maybe you can do yeah. some work around profiling new, new candidates and some CRM work at night, stuff like that. But sales is, yeah, it's a f- eight hour, like you only have so many business hours to run sales calls and that's when people will respond sure. to you. And so you got to grind for those, for those work hours. I think the biggest difference though, if I could boil it down in a very simple way, accounting is reactive by nature. Mm -hmm. Sales is proactive. And the more proactive you are, the more you can foresee things and anticipate things and really ask the tough questions that in accounting, you're probably seldom asking unless you're a CFO or an executive. Uh, That's what really differentiates you as a salesperson. So I think the background was crucial just given the product that we sell, no doubt about it. But I think some of the soft skills, the intangibles, the speech, cadence, tone, all that stuff wraps into making a good salesperson or in general, right? And and I learned that here uh, at a two bedroom house, which was great. Yeah. <laughs> oh, those were those were the days. Those that was a lot of fun. But yeah, so you, so you sold for a few years, and then uh, and then you made another move at Flowcast. Want to tell us about that? I did. Yeah, I did. So I sold for about two and a half years. Um, it was a very, very fun ride. Uh, I still go back to Q117 when we were at Chris Ludy's house and we probably sold the most deals we did out of his couch because we had, uh, I think the Wi-Fi was down or the power was down or something in the office. And so, I mean, it was, it was a great, great experience. But about two and a half years later, um, naturally given my accounting background, I found myself helping other account executives with technical things like it was right when we released transaction matching in our auto rec product. So I started doing demos for the folks that weren't as comfortable doing that. And even though I had my own quota, all that stuff, uh, I felt like assisting others was obviously a good thing. And so naturally it started to turn into this area where teaching and coaching and mentoring were always my strong suits. That was always my preference. Um, <clears throat> so I was fortunate enough to have you all pull me into a board meeting one day where as soon as I opened the door, I'm like, Holy shit! I'm fired. I, what did I do? What's going on? That's and, what you uh, thought. <laughs> I literally, literally, in my mind, I was like, "Oh my god, did I say something wrong in an email?" I had no idea. Out, like, What's going on? You know, and, and I never cursed in an email. I mean, we're having fun outside, sure, but um, so, anyways, I remember looking straight at you, and you looked at me, and you're like, "You're not fired, dude." <laughs> yeah, everything <laughs> was a good meeting. Like you, like read through my mind. It was pretty crazy. Um, but jokes aside, I mean, you all have the foresight to say, hey, we see that you're helping out other folks. You know, this we're growing and scaling as an organization. And really, a lot of software companies, they have account executives paired with sales engineers. And kind of reminds me back of my Jim Walker days, said, hey, well, I want you to start the sales engineering function. First question I had to you was, what's a sales engineer? You know, and, and I remember you described it's what you're doing today. You know, it's mm. how you're helping the team and how you can be technical. And so I remember after reading the job description, which was really make sales better. But uh, I think that was <laughs> it, right? And so that was it. JD, yeah. So, so it was going back to the notion of starting something from scratch. So that was in, I believe, April 1st of 2018 was my first day as a sales engineer, an army of one. Uh, fast forward two years, we built out a, an army of 13 sales engineers. 
um, across the globe, uh, operating, you know, in different territories. And uh, it's just been such a great experience. I think I got a <clears throat> got an ability to hire, grow a team, mold a team. And really, Adam Yarnell, who was our first sales engineering hire outside of myself and Megan Gallagher, uh, those two were at the helm of everything that I did. And without them, I don't think we would be as successful. So shout out to both of you guys for all your help and hard work. No, they're they're amazing. I mean, one of the things that blows my mind is, it, you know, I was talking to Chris and Colin up front about uh, Chris and Colin are co-founders and you you making this move. And I was just like, I, if we can have an army of Shivangs, ultimately being sales engineers at Flowcast, we're going to be in a great position. And I joked about how there's, you know, we're, I mean, we're not going to be able to make that happen, but, but like, dude, Yarnell is amazing. Megan's amazing. They have very high bars. They hire great people underneath them. And I, I'm of the opinion, it's the first three hires on a team that set the tone for how that culture is going to scale. And we saw that exactly with you. You have a high bar, you made those two hires, and then you were working with them while they built out the team. And it got to a point where you were just able to eject yourself with no problem. You know, I, I think it's one of the most amazing things to get a function off the ground, get it self-sufficient. And then honestly, you got bored with it. And I could yeah, tell I could I tell you were bored with it. I did. Yeah. Right. So I, I think how, how many? So you did it for three years was About roughly years. About two yeah. and a half, three years, something like that. But, you know, I'm naturally I'm not one to just say, hey, man, I'm, I'm tired or I'm bored or something or fix this for me. You know, I, I, I'm not. But maybe I should have, you know. But then again, I've been fortunate enough where you all saw this. I think Jill saw this, Ken saw this, you saw this. And we could tell, we could all tell. It was, uh... <laughs> so it was, it was, and I was at a point where I said, you know, I mean, I think the term I used was to my friends and family, I was like, Hey, I can do this job on autopilot. And some people would be like, Oh, that's great. That's great. To me, I was like, that's not great. That's a poison, you know, and I'm being complacent now. So I'm capping my learning capabilities. And so I was trying to figure out what to do about it. And sure enough, Here's my third opportunity that I'm now currently in. Rob Meinhart, one of our first investors, board members, uh, he messaged me on in Slack and said, hey, uh, do you want to grab a bite? Do you want to grab coffee? Rob and I have hung out. We've done dinner. So it wasn't like, oh, man, why is this board member hitting me up? You know, I mean, we we're buddies at the time already, but not a super strong relationship by any means, but we we're, we we're cordial. So I said, okay, cool. Maybe there's something he wants to chat about and we grabbed coffee. Uh, at this point, the offer and opportunity that he presented me was probably the most exciting opportunity I've ever had in my career. I think it's going to give me the skills and, and abilities to do things above and beyond that I ever imagined because of what I'm learning in this role. And what this role was all about was more of a go-to-market role, more of a strategy role where I was responsible for, and still am, of course, growing our Microsoft presence meaning customers more on a Microsoft ERP system, uh, really expanding our client base. And this was another thing that we hadn't done as an organization proactively. I mean, we were targeting NetSuite, Intact, a lot of the cloud-based mid-market ERPs, but organically, we built a pretty good client base of Microsoft clients at the start of this relationship. So Rob's going through all this stuff with me and he's telling me about growth rates and how we're clipping at a faster pace with Microsoft organically than we did with NetSuite in the same period for the last couple of years. And so I'm like, wow, okay. So first thing I told them, I said, this is exciting. Uh, let me see the data. You know, the data obviously proves uh, what the numbers are and the, and the opportunity. I mean, it didn't take me too long to understand that this was a gem, you know? And, and so immediately, I think I, I talked to you, uh, you told me it was like a two second conversation. You said, Chavong, take the role. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, and I talked to Sludi. I, I think I reached out to almost every executive and everyone gave me positive, encouraging words and said, you know, this is going to grow your career far faster than any other role and nothing against sales engineering. I mean, it was something that I was very happy doing and it could be a very successful career for lots, but I just, I got bored, I think, you know, and, and so this well, was sort of the curse team. of hiring such a good team. As well, you know, you didn't, you, you got to be hands off and it's like, well, Megan and Adam got it. So, yeah, yeah. I started to actually, I think I asked them, I said, guys, can I join a demo? Can I do something? And they, you know, <laughs> like we got it. You, you hang yeah. out. Yeah, <laughs> we got it. Yeah, exactly. So I'm like, okay. Um, so then I jumped into the role and now this, this, the, my current title is senior director of growth markets, growth markets, meaning start this from scratch. We knew that Microsoft and even our SAP initiative is something that we're really building from scratch, for lack of better words. But that include cross-functional involvement from sales, obviously an area that I'm comfortable in, but two other areas that I almost knew nothing about. 
marketing and our alliances side in the channel. Mm -hmm. So I think over the last few months, uh, it's been a hell of a learning experience, especially under the wing of Rob and Ken Sims. I mean, who've taught me a ton, um, but I feel more comfortable. I'm starting to feel a bit more dangerous and mm -hmm. things that I know over the next quarter and even the next year, I mean, we could take this thing through the roof and our story with Microsoft is so good. It's just, it was a no brainer to me, you know, and luckily the SE team was in complete support of the move. And they said, of course, we got this, you know, no worries. And we're so excited to see what you do over there. So awesome. thank you three times, I should say, Mike. I mean, dang. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm not doing it for no reason. You've, uh, you've earned it and you're, uh, yeah, you're just an amazing, you're an amazing person. I actually wanted to touch on, you know, outside of work. We talked, we talked a lot about work, but you're a very uh, unique and interesting person. So what's some of the, what's the, uh, tell us a little bit about Shivong outside of work. So uh, yeah, a few things. I think um, I, I think for me, personal activities, things I enjoy. Uh, I love, love, love. My number one activity, well, used to be basketball. I think that passion is kind of round, round down a little bit, especially when my back hurts so much now, being mid thirties. But hey, yep. that's the conversation. <laughs> um, but my number one game that I love to play outside of work is billiards. I love to shoot pool, and uh, I've actually been playing in. There's a there's a league. It's called APA, uh, and I've been playing in APA in LA. When I lived there and about three months ago, I moved to Tampa, Florida, and I've joined a league here as well. So nice. something I do on Monday nights just because Mondays suck. So it makes Mondays pretty fun. Um, and then I also love to love, love, love my spirituality. Um, you know, I've been I've been blessed by two great parents who have taught me the ropes since I was a younger kid and Hindu by nature. But I do a lot of meditation, do a lot of a lot of spiritual things like that just to keep my mind right, my soul right. And I think oftentimes, you know. Uh, we kind of joke about that, like mental health may not be as important, but I hate to hear that because I think, you know, spirituality and meditation guides yourself and mental health is so, so important. So uh, I, I give all the credit to my parents for instilling that to me. And it's something that even my wife today has kind of caught on and does the same, you know, and some of our best moments is when we meditate together. It's pretty cool. Oh, awesome. That's very cool. So, well, yeah, I, I man, I, I think it's a it's a fascinating mix of you're obviously very smart, hardworking, have the accounting background, but also competitive from your billiards uh, stuff for sure. I know you don't like to lose on the on the pool table, and then yeah, very thoughtful and just very introspective understanding of uh, of yourself and others. All right, they want me to ask one question before. So, uh, Shivong's the name, uh, Bang's the nickname. How'd you get the How'd you get the nickname? <laughs> Maybe we should play the William Ho video or Hung video that Ken displayed on my birthday in front of everyone in the rec room. Yeah, that was pretty <laughs> cool. Um, so it actually starts off, uh, like Mike said, Shivong is my technical name, but it starts off back in grade school. So for all of us, we remember roll calls. We remember when there was a substitute teacher and roll call would take place. And every time it came to my name, he or she would always butcher it. They'd always say, Shivang. Shivang is Shivang here? They're like four or five times. And to me, Shivang is like nails on a chalkboard. It's just giving me the cringe. And so at this time, for all of you music uh, enthusiasts, Ricky Martin's uh, Live in La Vida Loca was out and probably, I think, the pop hit. So the whole she bangs, she bangs, she moved. So that, that became uh, pretty big for all of my classmates. And so every time there was a substitute teacher, everyone started singing in unison. So <laughs> it, it started becoming shebanger. It started with shebangs to shebanger to banger and then to bang. And um, going back to my days in the clothes, when Seamus would again stomp down the hallway, he would you know, bang, bang, bang. Like we're like calling my name, obviously. But I swear to God, people would jump up out of their cubes like, holy shit, is something something going on? What's happening, you know? And so it was just pretty comical. But um, yeah, it's something that stuck with me and all my good friends and even my colleagues call me it's, bang. It great. It's like classic nickname stuff. It comes from this absurd original place. And then the name slowly morphs over time until it lands on something, which is bang. And then it follows true, you yeah. the rest Although of your life. <laughs> <from there. laughs> Although I do have to, I have to give a shout out to one of our account executives, Ryan Beveridge. He just closed a pretty massive Microsoft deal, but he's coined a new nickname for me, Pac-Man. What's the context? Well, I have no idea. He just posted. I have to ask him about it, but it sounded pretty cool. I like hey, it. Hey, I like uh, I like a big Microsoft deal getting closed as there well. There we go. Yeah, yeah. It, was a, it was a huge one. So that's pretty awesome too. Um, but yeah, awesome. I think Bank is probably going to stick a little bit more than Pac-Man. So. It's what I'm used to. It has an emoji in Slack. You know, that's pretty solidified when you get your own emoji in uh, in our Slack channel. So I think I think it's going to be sticking around. But I'm I'm curious to learn more about Pac-Man. 
Yeah. Well, I'll have to let you know because today was the first day I heard it. So <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, dude. Well, hey, thanks. Thanks for joining and sharing your story. Um, I am sure the audience is going to find it fascinating and just show like what you can do with an accounting background. Yeah, no, absolutely. Hey, more to share. Uh, happy to help. If anybody has questions, you can reach out to me. Um, but more than anything, thank you, Mike. Appreciate being on the podcast. This was fun. Of course. Thank you, man. Have a good one. Right, take care.